So I, I think being tied into the tens of trillions of dollars of managed assets is important. I mean, there, you know, there's really tens of trillions of dollars managed by uh, uh, RIAs or kind of big bank like broker networks, and a lot of that capital literally couldn't get into Bitcoin. And so it's, it's either stuck there because it's a retirement account or just because that's where the person wants it. And, you know, they might be open to putting one or two or three percent into Bitcoin. It just has not been an option because none of the vehicles have been kind of up to par. Uh, for those types of environments. And so to the extent that they're available, that is important uh, over a multi-year time frame. That can add billions of dollars of inflow, which has a multiplier effect, uh, especially when Bitcoin is very tightly held as it is now. And so that that is, it's not like it's a non-variable. Lynn Alden shed light on the possible integration of Bitcoin with the tens of trillions of dollars in managed assets. To give this perspective some context, let's look at the latest from Binance Research. In 2023, the crypto market saw a remarkable turnaround, with a 109% increase in market cap amid optimism surrounding spot Bitcoin ETF approvals. This year, analysts are forecasting continued progress, especially in areas like institutional adoption and the integration of real-world assets. These developments are pivotal, considering the potential billions of dollars that could flow into Bitcoin significantly influencing its market dynamics. It's a scenario that could reshape the financial landscape, merging traditional and digital asset management in unprecedented ways. If you're keen on staying ahead in the crypto space, hit that like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. The way I put it in my research is that uh, it doesn't really affect my view of the direction of the next two years, uh, but it, it, can, it can add more magnitude. Um, t to the upside uh, than, it, than if these didn't exist. And so, for example, I, I'm doubtful that ETFs are going to drive the next bull market, but I think that as that bull market materializes, that's that's another ease of inflow that could make the, the, the bull market do better than it would if, if these ETFs did not exist. You know, money tends to chase price, ironically. So it's like, uh, I think that the next bull market probably comes from the same types of directions that the bull market, the prior bull markets came from, which is, you know, we went through this bear market, a lot of the fast money's out of, the, of, the, of Bitcoin. It's kind of gravitated towards those strong hands, people that are dollar cost averaging in, uh, people that just, you know, they, they're like, listen to podcasts like this and they don't really plan on selling for the foreseeable future. They're kind of locked in. And so eventually you kind of get that really tight supply situation. And then you get uh, better liquidity conditions. So I, I've, mm -hmm. I've been kind of beating the drum for a while that Bitcoin is very correlated with uh, global liquidity metrics, uh, more so than any other asset I track. Um, and it's also the in inverse is true. So if I look at all the things that are correlated with Bitcoin, liquidity is, is arguably the highest. So the co like when the liquidity goes up, that tends to be constructive for Bitcoin price. But then it's especially so... When you've been in a bear market for a while and a lot of those loosely held coins have gravitated towards the stronger hands that are only going to come out with like a 5x increase as like a starting – like basically w once you breach all-time highs, when you start to get a little bit of distribution from those types of hands. Um, and then also when you break all-time highs, that's when you know people in their RIAs are saying like, why aren't, why aren't we in Bitcoin? The ETFs came out months ago. What are we doing? And, yeah. and so then, then you can get some of the inflows, and that's where I think it could add to it. it it's certainly a constructive, positive variable, but it's, for me, it's not the key catalyst, most likely. Do you think that these ETFs are going to tame volatility to some degree? I don't know if they specifically will, but I do think that on, on average, the more widely held something is, the, more, the less volatile it, it can be. Uh, and the more – because the more liquid it can be, right? So when Bitcoin is small enough that like FTX, like re you know, one and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin can really mess it up. Um, that's, you know, that when that kind of thing can happen, uh, it, it's going to move price more. Um, whereas if it's if it's five times as widely held, if it's 10 times as widely held, um, then there's fewer entities that can play games and, and kind of really mess up the price. Uh, and it's, it's more the assets more diffused in portfolios that are not like, quote unquote, crypto focused. Uh, that all get liquidated at once, basically. And so, you know, to the extent that people have it as a slice in a portfolio and rebalance it from time to time, whether it's the ETF or other vehicles, I mean, the ETF is now the most convenient vehicle for that. But then, you know, there's, there's also other ways to do it. Um, that that should, in theory, have a dampening effect on volatility. It doesn't mean I don't think we're going to have a big bull run and then a probably a pretty big drop. Um, but I think it could start taking the edge off uh, in either direction, because you know, if, if Bitcoin's way up and and it's pretty widely held at that point, 
um, you know, that can rebalance it back down to the downside a little bit. So if you look at some of the, you know, th- this past bull cycle was the first one that had like a rounded top. Uh, the other, the other ones all had these like crazy illiquid spike tops, right. mm-hmm. and this was the first rounded top. Uh, and unfortunately, the the bottom was not as uh, benign. There still was like a big kind of collapse because the F, you know partially because of the F, FTX thing. I would assume that's the norm going forward. Of course, Bitcoin can always surprise, but I, I think <laughs> yep. that you know that those spikes are a sign of kind of a, a less mature asset. And then as as it reaches you know, bigger amounts and, and things like that, you, you should expect more more of those kind of rounded rounded type of price action unless something extreme happens to it, unless, you know, you have a sovereign debt crisis in a major country or war or, you know, you, you, things like that. Lynn Alden's insights on ETFs are especially relevant when we consider the current market developments. The potential approval of Bitcoin ETFs in 2024 could be a game changer for cryptocurrency. These ETFs are not just financial instruments, but gateways that could open Bitcoin to mainstream institutional investment. This year also brings the much-anticipated Bitcoin halving event. Historically, halving events have preceded major bull runs in the Bitcoin market. If past patterns hold, we might see a significant upward trajectory in Bitcoin's price post-halving. This scenario presents an intriguing opportunity for investors and could mark a pivotal point in Bitcoin's journey towards widespread acceptance and stability. There's already like 600,000 coins in GBTC, yeah. uh, and so we're seeing we're seeing coins come out of that bucket, diffuse into some of these other buckets. They're all at you know, most of them are Coinbase anyway, uh, except for the Fidelity one, and I think a couple others are at Gemini. Um, and so you're seeing a, a diffusion of that. I think on average we'll see a net inflow, uh, but as Bitcoin gets more expensive. Um, you know the amount of ca- the amount of coins that can be captured in ETF, uh, even though the dollar amount might be higher, the number of coins is is still pretty hard to get a lot of coins into ETFs at this point. Bitcoin already had 15 years of distribution. Ironically, if if the ETF came out back when the Winklevi wanted it to come out, I mean they had the foresight to want it. Um, but if it came out then, maybe there would be more concerns about a very large percentage of it being kind of held in these giant honeypots. But now it's had 15 years to get out there. It's out in the wild. So it's hard to tame at this point. So I, I don't really have concerns around that. Uh, you know, there's always there, there's certainly concerns for people that are in those custodial environments. But I view it as less existential towards Bitcoin itself. And I'd further phrase it as um, it, it was inevitable. So if Bitcoin can't withstand a, an ETF, it didn't, never really mattered to begin with. And to go after the, the Bitcoin critics here, some of them were kind of like, oh, Bitcoin had a mission and now that mission's lost because it used the ETF on it. It's like Bitcoin doesn't even know it has an ETF on it. Bitcoin is just Bitcoin. In this case, one country, uh, their SEC and their court system allowed an ETF. A bunch of entities that are not affiliated with Bitcoin made ETF wrappers around it. It gives people one more buying access, one more kind of custody access, one more trading scaling scheme that's on top of it but it's a global asset um and and it just it's an open source network and so I, yeah i kind of view that as relatively irrelevant other than the extent that obviously you know if you do control a lot of coins you have some power over how like say hard forks turn out for example yep. um and and so it's not that concentration doesn't matter at all it's just that there's already you know there's already some degree of concentration luckily it's not that high and i don't think the introduction of the ets really changed that it just kind of shifts around where it is what's your take yep. on mstr what do you if you what are you going to do with that allocation probably reduce that one um that i've been using that as a diversifier because i didn't fully trust gbtc i wanted um a little bit of distributed risk uh towards another vehicle uh, given the limited options available uh, prior to the ETF launches. It's a great company. Uh, the fact that you have fixed um, non-callable leverage attached to Bitcoin has been really well played. Uh, their, their treasurer, the one who actually handles the tactical decisions on you know wh- how they're going to optimize their holding, you know I, I know him and he's like he's really sharp and so they, they've executed that really well when, when, when the equity gets expensive, they're like selling more equity and buying more Bitcoin. When they had options earlier, they were issuing that debt. So I, I think they've managed that really well. They've actually de-risked their balance sheet by issuing this, this more equity. I think over time, that premium is probably going to decrease because now there's pure ways to express a long position. 
I still think it's it's somewhat rocket fuel because you have that kind of fixed amount of leverage attached to it. So if someone's yeah. really bullish on Bitcoin, that 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 <clears throat> can still outperform. Um, so it's not like I think that MicroStrategy doesn't serve a role anymore. I, I just think that it, it's it's earlier use as a Bitcoin proxy is is now somewhat diminished by the ETFs, and I think they understand that. I think that basically they, you know, they they've been a really important vehicle in, in the time they're at, and they permanently improved the value of their company by playing that role at a time when people needed it. And so now they've, even if people switch over to the ETFs, that doesn't change the fact that MicroStrategy has a really big Bitcoin hoard now. It might grow more slowly than it did because of the arbitrage opportunities that were available, but they still have it and they still have a good software business. And so I I think they made all the right moves pretty much. Now let's explore the diffusion of Bitcoin from concentrated holdings like GBTC into more distributed landscapes, a transition that Lynn Alden discussed. 2024 is witnessing an exciting fusion of blockchain technology with artificial intelligence. Crypto tokens related to AI, such as Bittensore and Render, have seen substantial growth, highlighting the market's enthusiasm for these emerging technologies. Additionally, the trend of real-world asset tokenization is accelerating. Major financial institutions are exploring the tokenization of funds and deploying them on public blockchains, indicating a significant shift in how traditional assets are managed. This move towards a more distributed form of Bitcoin ownership not only democratizes investment, but also aligns with the core philosophy of Bitcoin, decentralization and open access. Remember, at Unscripted Crypto, we're all about bringing you the most insightful and up-to-date analysis. If you enjoyed this episode, show us some love with a like. And don't forget to subscribe for more in-depth discussions.